You're at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. I'm John Cook, uh, professor and chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist. And I'm joined uh, to my left here by Dr. Keith Duker, associate professor in the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences. And today we have a very special guest, Dr. Cindy Martin, uh, who is now uh, our new chief of the heart failure division uh, here at uh, Houston Methodist. And uh, we're very happy to have, uh, have recruited Dr. Martin uh, from University of Minnesota. Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Martin and why we're so happy to have her here. Uh, she is an amazing physician scientist who is a cardiovascular doc and cardiovascular investigator, and really understands heart failure at a molecular level. Uh, that comes from uh, the training uh, that she had, which started at LSU where she got her MD. Uh, and then she went to UT Southwestern. And there uh, she did her internal medicine. She did her cardiology fellowship and she did an advanced uh, heart failure fellowship. And during that period of time, she also uh, did a postdoc in molecular cardiology, one of the best institutions in the country uh, to get that kind of training. And of course, then she was highly sought after. Uh, University of Minnesota was lucky to recruit her in 2007, and there she established a, an advanced heart failure program and uh, really augmented the uh, transplant program that they had uh, there. And uh, also, in addition to those clinical activities, she continued her research and uh, garnered a number of awards, American Heart Association and uh, NIH funding uh, to do her uh, molecular research in uh, heart failure. And more recently, she received an American Heart Association Innovator Award, and uh, she has an R01 also uh, to study the molecular basis of right ventricular failure. And we're so happy to have Dr. Cindy Martin here at Houston Methodist and with us tonight. Welcome, Dr. Martin. Thank you. Thank you for having me here, and thank you for having me here at Houston Methodist. I'm excited to join this amazing group. Mm -hmm. You are a physician scientist mm -hmm. uh, studying heart failure, taking care of patients with heart failure. Uh, Tell us how that role is different from being a physician taking care of heart failure patients. What, what is your edge as a physician scientist? Uh, what do you bring uh, to your patients, to the, to the bedside with that kind mm -hmm. of a background? Yeah, I mean, I think it's twofold, actually. I mean, one, I think that sometimes we overlook a little bit is actually just the kind of approach. So obviously when we are trained in more of a basic science or in the scientific rigor, you're trained in that experimental approach, kind of that investigational design of, of you know, kind of maybe having one variable or trying to figure out, you know, cause effect. And so I think being having that uh, basic science and physician scientist training really brings a different approach, kind of even from a diagnostic um, and therapeutic thought process um, for a scientist, for a, for a clinician. Um, you know, I always laugh and say, you know, in the basic science lab, you can control all the variables, but you can't control the outcome. And the flip side is kind of in, in the clinical medicine, you can't control any of the variables. And sometimes we hope to control the outcome. Um, but they really kind of do, I think, augment each other very well. Mm -hmm. The second thing I think, as you point out, is really just a, a different understanding of the physiological process. And so really kind of stepping back and maybe learning some of the, the, um, kind of the background and maybe the cause of some of the things. And we'll talk about some of those things when it comes to, you know, even with cardiomyopathies of whether it's either muscular energetics or if it's signaling pathways or some of those things. And then lets you then kind of try to key into like, well, maybe what therapy, you know, will help uh, improve the problem. But more importantly, it actually, I think it helps highlight what we don't know. Mm -hmm. And so I think when we look at, when I'm able to look at some of our patients and some of their, their clinical problems and realize that we don't understand a lot mm -hmm. of the basis of some of those things. And so being able to bring some of those questions back, mm -hmm. I think, to the lab to try to answer things to look forward. And then flip side, taking some of the things that we may learn in the lab and in the research to kind of bring into patients. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's an amazing um, uh combination and I'm very fortunate to have been able to you know mm -hmm. kind of see both worlds. You know you just mentioned uh, the, yeah, the obverse so so uh, taking those insights that you gain at the bedside or the questions mm -hmm. that you glean from the bedside and then trying to answer those in the basic science laboratory and I think I guess that's what we're going to be hearing about today <laughs> right how the uh, uh, what you've observed at the bedside and, and uh, you know, how that uh, led to uh, research, basic research questions. Um, 
Can, can you tell us uh, uh, about uh, a particular question uh, that uh, came to you when you were at a patient's bedside? Um, well, we'll talk a little bit about it, you know, as we move forward. But um, in addition to some of my training in heart failure, I also have a strong interest in adult congenital cardiology. Mm. And when we really are looking at some of our adult congenital patients and some of their hearts are, are they're born with abnormal hearts. And so where normally the left ventricle is the main pumping chamber, you know, and does a lot of the work in some of our congenital patients, it's the opposite. It's the right ventricle. And then what we see is that we don't have medicines to actually treat right ventricular failure um, and what we've learned in the recent years is that the ones that we you know have for left ventricular failure don't really work for right ventricular failure mm. and so th that struck me as well why is that mm. or, or why are they so different and having as you you know point out my developmental cardiology training you know it was kind of funny to me when everybody else was so surprised and i'm like why are you surprised like they come from completely different places. Mm -hmm. Like the cells that make these parts of the heart are, are derived from different areas, they form differently. And so it's not a surprise that the medica medications that treat one doesn't treat the other because they're not the same. They, they, yes, they both are in the same organ, but that's about where their you know, similarities end. So I think it's some of those things that, you know, that really struck me as some of the questions and, and being able to, to hopefully, you know, get some understanding of some of those processes. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, so the, being a physician scientist you, uh, is, is complementary mm -hmm. uh, to, to both disciplines, uh, is what you're saying. Um, another question for you, how do you balance that? Uh, because, <laughs> I mean, those are two different lexicons. Yeah. Being, being a doctor, taking care of patients with heart failure, being in the lab and trying to use molecular cardiology approaches to understand the mm -hmm. basic mechanisms of heart failure. How do you balance those? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, the short answer is I don't very well. <laughs> I mean, I think when you look at other people, it's, it's really trying to find that. And, you know, it highlighted, I mean, really probably the one of the times that I was most dissatisfied in my career was when I was trying to do both all the time, having two jobs, and being mediocre at both. Mm -hmm. And that was very unfulfilling to me because I don't do mediocre well. Mm -hmm. But what I realized is I have to find a way to find a niche question that really I can complement what I do in the lab and to the patients. But more importantly, in 2023, I think it's about collaborations. I think, you know, gone are the days where you really can have one person that can spend 50% of their time in the lab and 50% of their time at the bedside and do both excellently because we're just too advanced. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's really of, you know, finding institutions like this, like Houston Methodist, where we can coordinate and find that collaborative nature mm -hmm. where we can use each other's strengths you know, and then and leverage those to be able to synergize um, to answer those questions appropriately. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of wisdom there. I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think from failure comes wisdom <laughs> and hopefully learn a little bit. <laughs> you and I both know that. Um, I'm going to turn to you for just a moment, Dr. Euchre. So Dr. Euchre is the PhD in the room. Um, MD, PhD is here, right? <laughs> PhD. Um, what, you know, you've worked with uh, clinicians, uh, heart failure docs, and uh, as, as a, a basic scientist, what, what advantage does that give you to be able to have that kind of collaboration with clinicians? Well, I think that collaboration is very important. It, I'm a basic scientist, but I actually went through medical school as well. To, it, it was a program designed to make uh, scientists that focused in real world problems. In other words, I, I learned about cardiology, I learned about the heart and blood and all those systems, as well as the molecular biology end of things that we do as, as basic scientists. So being able to make sure that we're, we're in touch with the clinical people so that we can actually do meaningful research, that allows me to provide my expertise in the basic science laboratory on real questions, real problems, that the clinicians face. So it orients you. It orients your research Correct. to have that kind of clinical Correct. input. We have to have that, that, that clinical uh, uh, input in order to do reliable, good science. Mm -hmm. Even though I like to control all the variables, as, as you mentioned, um, I, I know I can control them, but if I don't know what the end game is, what it is we're trying to focus and solve, there's no way I can use those tools effectively to, to actually have an impact in uh, the clinical world, which is really where we want to have the impact. Mm -hmm. 
Great. Thanks for that. You know, another thing I want to mention is that uh, Dr. Martin has been very much involved in uh, societies, professional societies. She's, she's an excellent scientific citizen, medical citizen uh, in our community, um, been involved in the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, the ISHLT, International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation. Are, are you doing any work with those organizations currently? or? So I think, yes, I'm still active in all those organizations, as you pointed out. Um, in working with uh, you know, the United Network of Organ Sharing. And, and um, I think it's important that we continue to remind our clinical community too the important importance of physician scientists. Mm -hmm. um, because I think it's in this day and age, again, it's harder to find that. It's harder to to honestly to fund them sometimes and to fund their their time because it is hard to continue grants. It's hard to continue that, especially to when you're having a busy clinical practice. But truly, I think the physician scientists are going to be very critical in moving us to those next steps. They're going to help us, you know, as you kind of pointed out, answer some of those questions. And as Dr. Uecker pointed out, it's gone are the days where we're learning about a gene just to know it exists. We have to figure out, you know, of a clinical relevance to that and we move in to move that into a clinical practice. And I think, it's, again, it's that marriage. And so I try to be an advocate for physician scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have to continue to imp to realize their importance. And, I, you know, I, I, when I talk with, even with younger um MDs and PhDs and people who are doing training, you know, there's a huge satisfaction from being from both sides, you know, and in the medical world and the medical school, there's a huge satisfaction of seeing that patient and seeing that input that you have. But I remind people of step back and remember, like, even if we work, you know, 120 hours a week, 52 weeks out of the year, you know, seeing patients, we can only see so many patients. But if you go back and think of even the simple things like who developed penicillin? How many millions of lives have been impacted from a single scientific right. discovery? Right. And so it's kind of reminding that of like we have to understand that th th we have to support both mm -hmm. and that they both are critical for optimizing right. patient care. Right. Really good. Really good comments. Well, I think now we'll uh, turn toward uh, the physician scientist's <laughs> knowledge and wisdom is going to, we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Martin talking about modeling right ventricular dysfunction. So let's proceed. Thanks. Well, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about one of our stories that we're working on, and it really is look at kind of modeling a right ventricular dysfunction. So why are we even talking about heart failure? I mean, most of the people know that heart failure is a huge problem. Over 6.5 million Americans over the age of 20 have heart failure, and more than 26 million people more than, uh, worldwide. There's almost a million new cases alone in the U.S., and we talk about healthcare costs, more than $40 billion is spent in heart failure. Kind of a scary thought, um, at the age of 40, <clears throat> may have passed that. Um, if you look at that, the lifetime risk of developing heart failure is one in five. So 20% of people actually develop heart failure. Um, and more, I think, sobering than that, half of the people who develop heart failure will die within five years of their diagnosis. So it's an incredibly you know, uh, morbid disease. When we talk about left ventricular dysfunction, which is mostly what we think of when we think of heart failure and LV dysfunction, we've, got, we've come a long way. There's a lot of medications. We can see schematized here where different organizations have shown us uh, medicines that will improve not only uh, how people feel, but how long that they can live with treatment. When our medications don't work, we have options such as transplant as well as our left ventricular cyst devices, mechanical support. So we've come a long way in the past. 20 years of treating uh, LV dysfunction. Unfortunately, we haven't come very far when we look at RV dysfunction or RV heart failure. Now, RV heart failure is a risk factor for death in multiple medical conditions, both in regular LV heart failure, as well as valvular cardiomyopathy, a passion of mind, adult congenital heart disease, as well as pulmonary hypertension. And as we talked about earlier, there are no current specific treatments for RV heart failure. We've also learned that unfortunately the meds that we use to treat LV dysfunction aren't particularly effective when it comes to RV failure. And we're just now starting to understand some of the molecular mechanisms um, that underlie RV heart failure. Now, as we talked about, you know, as my background as a developmental cardiologist, again, this wasn't horribly surprising to me because they're very different. So the right ventricle actually comes from a separate set of cells called the secondary heart field, 
where the left ventricle comes from a different cell, it's called the primary heart field. And these are genetically very different from em embryologic nature. There's a lot of other things that look at about the shape of the left ventricle, how each in uh, the shape of the right ventricle, how they both respond to pressure or versus volume overload. Honestly, how many layers of cells there are. There's two in the RV and three in the LV. And even how they contract. Um, they're just different and they're, and they're made um, because they were structured to handle a different physiological aspect. So when we started looking at really in cardiac development, you know, most of our development really is looking at small animal models. And so that's what we grew up with. And that's where I grew up doing, looking at small animal mouse model and rat model, really looking at the cardiac development because we can uh, change genetically these animals. Their lifespan is very appropriate for studying. It's a, it's a great pathway. And many different medical therapies have been started in the mouse, small animal models, um, and have led to a lot of opportunities. But what we found is those don't always translate into humans. And I think one of the classic ones, again, back to some of the congenital heart disease is in Marfan syndrome. So in Marfan syndrome, we created this mouse, we found the model, we found the pathway, and then we um, were actually able to find a drug to treat Marfans, and you could cure Marfans in mice. Mm -hmm. And Losartan. we were, yeah, with Losartan, with the TGF beta pathway. And we were all incredibly yeah. excited that now we can cure Marfans. And then when we transitioned that to humans, eh, not quite so much. Um, and so we did, it did have an impact, and Losartan does have a place in therapy. But the dramatic, basically, reversal of the phenotype that we saw in mice, and we didn't see in humans. And, and there's many other examples for that. And so we've kind of learned that we probably need another step. Um, and that led us to look at using the porcine model, the pig model, for uh, looking at heart research. And why do we look at the, the pig model? Well, first of all, the cardiac development and the anatomy of the pig is very similar to humans. It's actually one of the most similar. Um, it's interesting, the heart to body size ratio is preserved hmm. in, in pigs and humans, which is another thing that's not always in their small animals. The physiology is very similar. So for those of you who kind of have done some small animal research, we know a heart rate in a mouse or a rat can be up to between 500 and 800 beats per minute. Um, obviously humans aren't that fast. Maybe mine was a little bit earlier when we started talking, but maybe not quite that fast. Um, but in pigs, it's similar, kind of around that 100 beats per minute. Um, there's also similar disease progression that we've seen in pigs as far as looking at coronary artery disease as well as heart failure. Um, but the most important for me from a developmental and uh, genetic standpoint is the sequence and uh, genetic sequence and chromosome structure of pigs is the most common to humans other than mammals, it's uh, other than primates. So of mammals, pigs actually have the highest homology other than primates. And that's shown kind of on the graph where you can see the lines between pig and human are shorter than the ones between human uh, and, and mice. And just recently, we've been able to actually sequence the entire pig genome. And they're also doing transgenic pigs, meaning that we can change the genes in pigs now to really look at studying them. So it's really become a very interesting model. So given my kind of developmental background, and so as we said before, we knew that there were a lot of differences between the LV and the RV, but I was like, when are they most alike? Well, before we're born, we're not breathing. And so the right ventricle actually sees a very high pressure, similar to what the left ventricle does. So in fetal, the right ventricle is basically working like a left ventricle, it's pumping against a high pressure. As soon as we're born and we take those first breaths and our lungs expand, the pressure on the right side of the heart plummets dramatically. Uh, and then it becomes a low pressure system and the LV becomes a high pressure system. So my kind of question was, well, if it was a high pressure system to begin with, and then if genes turn off when it becomes low pressure, are those important? Do we need to turn them back on? But first of all, we had to figure out what they were. Um, and so that's where we went to the pigs and we took pig model. We took a fetal pig one week before it was born. We took a pig, a ne neonatal pig one week after born and then a, a pig at one month. And we're able to look at the heart. And if you can see, you see that kind of the pictures If when a fetal pig, you can see the left and the right side are but very the similar. Same They're size. Si same size, very thickness, very hypertrophy. But if you go all the way, when you get to one month, you can see that the mm -hmm. right ventricle is now almost half the size of the left ventricle. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of de-hypertrophied for a lack of a better word. Mm -hmm. um, 
we're also able to look and we, we um, took samples from this and we, we did RNA seq. So we basically sequenced all of the RNA. And what you can see is the pigs actually, they, the samples really clustered well to each other. So the fetal, the one week, the one month, and actually they were more alike at time period than RV or LV. We did a little bit of just kind of assessing to see, okay, do things that we know should be changed or the pattern that we see in, in uh, mice and actually in humans, do we see that same pattern in pigs? And the answer was yes, that we saw a lot of the transcriptional pathways um, were preserved in the pigs. We saw then some of the uh, structural pathways, the sarcomeric proteins, some of the calcium handling, and some of the metabolism. They changed the way that we thought that they should, um, so that was encouraging. I'm just to, I, just yeah. to ask a question. When you say they changed the way that we think they should, mm -hmm. I, I, can you explain that? Sure. I mean, so you're looking at what time points now? So this is uh, fetal uh, is in red, uh, one week is in blue, and then adult, basically one month, is in green. Mm -hmm. And so um, from a lot of developmental data in both mice, small animals, as well as data that we know from human data, these changes have been well uh, kind of grafted or explained. So kind of as, well, like for example, like as the heart um, matures, that you can see some of these structural proteins increase. Okay. You know, and so it goes from, and then similar things of with some of the calcium channeling, uh, calcium <laughs> signaling, and met, uh, metabolic changes. So during development of the pig heart, the changes mm -hmm. that you're seeing as the pig is uh, maturing yep. is, is what you see in humans. Correct. Okay. They mirror what we see in humans. Okay. So then we took all of these, you know, thousands of ACTs and Gs and terabytes and kind of tried to make some sense of them. And honestly, this is the most challenging part of when you look at some of this data, if you get all of these things and what do they mean. And so what we did is we just kind of tried to make some clusters of kind of saying, okay, how did genes change? And basically we made every combination of high and fetal, you know, middle and neonate and low and adult, you know, low, middle, high, high, middle, low, I mean, all the combinations. Um, to kind of look to see of, of just some of these things and you know just of interest and we'll um, come back to this a little bit but I really was particularly in still am interested in these um, where you see D and E of the RV of where they start out strong and go down low so again what are these genes that are expressed when the heart is, when the right side is really seeing a lot of high pressure and then do they go away when they see low pressure but we also went back and looked to say, okay, do they act the same? Do the left side of the heart and right side of the heart, do they act the same? We thought we knew the answer to that question, um, but we wanted to double check. And what we thought was turned out to be true, that they really are regulated very differently. So this Venn diagram kind of shows, if you look at the changes between fetal versus one month of genes that go down and fetal versus one month of genes that go up. And if you look at the ones that are unique to the LV, is a lot higher than what's shared between LV and RV. Um, and then similarly here, again, what's unique to LV is very different than what's shared. And the RV has its unique signature as well. And so we've got some things where they don't behave like they do, uh, that they, they behave differently, which we kind of see. And I think probably in here somewhere is some of the answers <laughs> to why, you know, uh, some of the differences between them are. Um, again, this just kind of shows a little bit of, of uh, you know, some of the transcriptional stuff of how they change differently. You can just see these are just some genes that we kind of picked um, to show kind of differences. And one thing I'll, I'll kind of, you know, um, kind of point out is that they do just, you can see different patterns. And that's kind of what we were looking at here. But then I kind of went back and said, okay, so now I know what happens when I go from a low, from a high pressure to a low pressure system of the RV and kind of normal. But what happens if I make it high pressure again? Like, what does the heart do? And then can I look at genetic changes there? So we went back and again, we went, this is where we used our pig again model. And we did a, a, a procedure where we actually put a band, we constricted around the pulmonary artery. And that's the main artery that um, is leading from the right ventricle to the lungs. And so if you put, if you constrict that, you basically make the right ventricle work a lot harder. 
And so we, we put a band around that and we initially banded it about half, but then as I was, we were talking a little bit earlier, I forgot that pigs grow and plastic doesn't. Hmm. Um, and so the band actually became very constricted. And you can see that picture here of the MRI. You can see where that arrow is. I mean, that you narrow that artery down substantially. Um, and what we saw with that is it actually changed a substantial amount of the pressure. And so when we started out, the pressure in the right ventricle, just native, was about 30, about 20, which is about normal in humans, mm -hmm. about 30 millimeters in the RV. After we banded it, we banded it to about 37. So again, I increased it about, you know, 100% there. But then when it grew, we got it banded all the way up to 83. Mm -hmm. And at that same time, in what we saw in, um, in the LV, Again, it kind of shows that we said, you know, 84 in the RV, and then at that same time, in a, when we measured the LV, it was 83. So basically, we created where the pressures were equal, left side and right side. Um, after a month of this banding, we also looked and we did MRIs of the heart. And what you were able to see is that the RV was substantially thickened. And so now the RV wall is back almost the same thickness as the left ventricle. And then uh, for those of you who do a lot of pulmonary hypertension, you can recognize that D-shaped ventricle of the left ventricle where the right ventricle pressure is basically pushing against it. And so it loses its circle and it makes a D. So really we, again, had all the characteristics that we see in our um, human data. And we also saw that these hearts didn't work very well. And so we saw both with various numbers of whether we look at kind of TAPSI measurements, which is a ventricle, or just ejection fractions, that they were compromised. So we created a, a model of right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular heart failure. So then we then took um, RNA samples from these and compared them back to the controls. And what we were able to do with looking at, you know, different analysis pathways, that we found certain pathways that were associated with the right ventricular failure. And so we just looked at EF, well, what gene changes correlated with ejection fraction? And um, some of those pathways were some of the lysosomal pathways, the metabolic, which makes sense because in heart failure, we see changes in glycolytic and, and, uh, and um, the different metabolism pathways that we see, um, and also fatty, fatty acid metabolism. So things that weren't surprising, but we're interested to see kind of recapitulate in the RV as well. When we looked at pathways that were associated actually with RV hypertrophy, this was very striking to me because some of the pathways were actually the dilated cardiomyopathies as well as the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So all of a sudden we're getting genes now that we know clinically we're seeing in different models. And so it looks like there's some, some of these molecular underpinnings from some of these diseases that we can start learning some about. There's an interesting question that just came up from the audience, and, and you're looking at transcriptional comparisons mm -hmm. between right and left heart and mm -hmm. also uh, normal pressure, yep. high pressure. Yep. The question is, when you did these comparisons, did you include the intraventricular septum? That, yeah. That, yeah, so we had it, and, um, and let me also, I should say, um, just for clarification, this was actually uh, transcriptome and proteomics. Mm -hmm. So we actually have looked at both. Um, so both transcriptional pathways and proteomic pathways because we know that they're both important and we can argue later of which is the most, we'll arm wrestle, who do people have very strong opinions. Um, we did think about the interventricular septum. We have that data, but I will, we intentionally left it out because I don't think we understand the interventricular septum well enough. Um, there is a debate upon what part of the heart forms the interventricular septum, um, and I think that that is still a little bit unclear. First heart First heart field versus, versus second, second heart field. Mm -hmm. um, is it more RV? Is it more LV? Is it a combination of LV and RV? So we intentionally, at least right now, left that out because I had so many unknowns yeah. that I didn't, was like, I don't even know what I compare that with. So you're looking at the free, free wall. walls. Okay. Free walls. RV free wall and LV free wall. Perfect. Um, and we actually, I didn't talk about it here, but we created a very systematic pathway uh, where we harvested animals same, above the microvalve annulus at certain distances. So we were uh, consistently um, sampling the same tissue area and characteristics as best we could. So again, like when we saw this, you know, RV hypertrophy, again, with the dilated cardiomyopathy and the rhythmogenic cardiomyopathy pathways. Um, and then with RV dilatation, again, we kind of saw a different group. And now we've got some of the, again, metabolic areas citric acid, the uh, respiratory uh, electron transport chain uh, systems were also very uh, per uh, perturbated both uh, transcriptomally and uh, proteomically. 
The other thing that we kind of looked at of kind of going back was like, okay, well, from some of the work that one of my collaborators, Kurt Prinz, has done at the University of Minnesota, they've done a lot of work um, with this in rats. And we'll talk about that here in a minute. But we asked the question, okay, well, we've got data of pigs. We've got human data that's been published of looking at compensated and decompensated heart failure. And we've got rat data, which looks more like humans. And uh, I think not surprisingly, but kind of important to see that they were all different. And if the things that especially it struck me of some of these things, although the same, um, the same pathways uh, came up in both rats and pigs and humans, if you look especially in like the uh, here in the uh, fatty acid metabolism, here's rat and here's pig. And they're almost directly opposite hmm. of the changes that they make. Hmm. And here's human. Now here in the human, what you have, you have control, and then you have compensated, which is the C stands for, of RV failure, and then decompensated RV failure. So meaning someone who has a low EF but has no heart failure symptoms versus someone who has a low EF and heart failure. And what you see is actually that the data shows that the pig looks more like the decompensated human failure. Um, but I think it kind of gets into the fact that a lot of these pathways are similar, but their regulations may be a little bit different between small animal model and humans. And obviously, and humans are, you know, again, more, more uh, complex because again, you have heart, you have low EFs, you have like people who are having heart failure symptoms. I will say our pigs were really decompensated RV. Um, they did develop heart failure. We had to treat them with Lasix, you know, because they had volume overload. Um, so it's kind of exciting to see that we're seeing uh, a model that seems to be recapitulating uh, some of the human RV data. I'll tell you a little bit of a quick story of kind of where we pick some of these things and how, how actions that maybe we can use this data. And so again, if we go back and we talk about RV failure in, um, in pulmonary hypertension, um, the, we know that the right ventricular function determines outcome. So really how your RV does says how you're gonna do. And that's been really shown in what we call primary pulmonary hypertension, but it's also recently been shown in what we call secondary pulmonary hypertension or patients whose right heart uh, doesn't or their pulmonary pressures are high because their left heart doesn't work. Um, and there's been an association that, again, the group at Minnesota had kind of looked at of this interleukin-6. And what they found is that interleukin-6 is elevated in people who have pulmonary hypertension. But interesting what they saw is it didn't correlate with the degree of the pulmonary vascular resistance. So how bad they could have really you know, mild pulmonary hypertension or severe pulmonary hypertension, and their interleukin levels really didn't change. But what it did change is when their RV function changed. And so if their RV function was poor, then we, in comparing that to normal RV, then we started seeing the breakdown mm -hmm. of the interleukin-6 signaling. And we know, again, that interleukin-6 in humans has been associated with prognosis. And so now we're starting to tie again that together. And so they were able to look down and go through some of the mechanisms. I'm not gonna go through all of this, but the short answer is that interleukin-6 interacts with a signaling called a GP130, which is a signaling pathway that then uh, changes microtubular function and even mitochondrial function and through a, a, a signaling pathway. And Kurt and uh, Sasha Prisco at Minnesota has this model where they create uh, pulmonary hypertension in a mouse and they have treated um, using an antagonist of GP130. And basically what they can do is they can reverse the changes in the microtubular issues as well as the mitochondria. Uh, but again, it doesn't change how bad the pH is. So by treating this, they still have severe pulmonary hypertension and you can see the changes there. The arterioles and stuff are greatly thickened. The pressures are high but it makes their, the fibrosis in the right ventricle, the RV go down and it makes their function go up. Mm -hmm. So this is another pathway where they're not treating pulmonary hypertension, they're treating the RV. And so we're excited now, we saw, we said, okay, again, um, what about in our, in our banding model, what happens here? And so again, we knew that we created basically a pH model as far as that we have high pressure, systemic pressures, their RVs thicken, they don't work well. 
And so we went in and we saw, yeah, the same, the same pathway is actually activated in the pig. And we see higher levels um, of the GP130 and we see a breakdown of the T tubular function. And so the R01 grant that we have is actually looking at that, of can we now take this antagonism uh, of GP130 in the pig model and can we recapitulate what we saw as far as the uh, improvement in the RV function um, in the pig like we saw in the rat? And more importantly, if so, does it work the same way? Mm -hmm. And so we may see a benefit, but we may see it through different pathways. Um, and it may be that you know, some of those can also shed light on some other drugs that we can look at of why we might want to, um, to target some things. So we're just in the preliminary, um, we have some, some um, treated animals that are going, we're starting to get some of their function. It's looking promising, but you, know, you never wanna to go on the N of one yet. So we're excited to see what some of those are. And so I think that's just kind of an example of where we can take you know, something where we saw a clinical problem of a need of where we have this RV failure that we're seeing, you know, in you know, a passion of mine and congenital heart disease. We see it in pulmonary hypertension. We see it in our LVAD population of post LVAD. A, a, it's a big area that we don't have good treatments for. We go back to the basic science of the development and learn that they develop differently. We learn some of those things and now we can translate that hopefully into large animal models to be able to, you know, hopefully bridge that gap between you know bench to bedside, in this case using a, a pig in between. <laughs> and so that really kind of, that kind of wraps up a little bit of that story. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's amazing. Thank you, Cindy, for that. Absolutely. Um, you mentioned that IL-8, IL-6 uh, IL rather, mm -hmm. IL-6 is going up with, uh, w w with right ventricular dysfunction. Mm -hmm. what, what is the mechanism? Well, that's what we're kind of trying to answer. So I think they, you know, um, uh, Kurt and Sasha, have looked at that in a rat model and mm -hmm. they can see it through a GP130 and a signaling pathway called junctifilin 2. They have some of those pathways there. We're looking to see if we if we recapitulate that in the large animal model. Um, obviously we don't have any human data yet to be able to, I mean we know IL-6 you know is down and we know that T-tubulars are, T-tubular function and mitochondria are changed in uh, human uh, pulmonary uh, arterial hypertension with RV dysfunction, but we're still trying to see if those same pathways are the same. Is it possible it could be related to venous pressure in the gut uh, and some alteration in the uh, permeability of the gut to... Yeah, for to sure. Now, you, you know, I'm smiling because there's a whole group of data where they're looking at the microbiome mm -hmm. and some of those things with pulmonary hypertension as well and some of that in, in the um, gut regulation of some of these things. So absolutely, I think mm -hmm. we're going to find, you know, some of these uh, um, uh, kind of pathways that are going to be, that are overlap. You know, we bring up, you know, again, another area that's completely different, but in some way has similar things. If, when we talk about our congenital heart disease patients, so those who have what we call a Fontan physiology. And so where they only have one, they have one ventricle that's pumping to the body and the, the blood goes through the lungs through a passive gravity basically effect. And so those are filling pressures are higher in the gut. They get cirrhosis, liver problems, but they also get a lot of gut conditions and even a condition called protein losing enteropathy or PLE, which we don't really understand. Mm -hmm. But again, some of these same things that we see this gut uh, venous congestion overlap. So I, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, again, it's, the challenge with, with all of this has been, how do we model it? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and small animals will get us to a certain degree, but again, when we're looking at especially these organ interactions um, and physiology, you know, we have to, I think, look at some of our larger animal models to be able to hopefully um, either confirm, you know, what we saw in the small animals, because I do truly think some things will be the same, but it's just gonna be more complex. And I think you're gonna see a lot more of that interaction. I think hopefully that's where our large animals will help us. I want to remind our listeners that uh, they can uh, contribute to the discussion here. There's two ways to do it. Uh, you can do it uh, by joining us on the web. Go to pollev, that's P-O-L-L-E-V dot -L -L -E com. Enter DeBakey, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, and respond to the activity. Or you can join us by text. Uh, just text DeBakey to 37607 and then text in your message and uh, we'll get your question and uh, we'll uh, transmit that to Dr. Martin. We do have uh, one question from the audience here uh, that you might want to address mm -hmm. in your banding model. Mm -hmm. uh, in the PA banding model, um, have you unbanded some of the animals to study 
shifts in the transcriptomics, proteomics of the RV and the physiology and yeah. yeah. So it's a good question. We haven't um, part of the problem when you band them, especially when we band them this tightly is after you remove the van, the constriction still remains. You got fibrosis. You got fibrosis. There, yeah. You have some other stuff. And so if we really wanted to look at kind of debanding, it may be another honestly surgical procedure mm -hmm. of cutting it out and so and which, you know, we can do, but that's a whole different level. It's a different level. It's a different uh, question, but it's an interesting yeah. question, right? Because I think what the the um, question is getting to is is, is uh, are the processes that have been triggered by the banding, by mm -hmm. the pulmonary hypertension, are they reversible? Yeah. And so I think the short answer, so the, the clinical data that we have would suggest yes. Mm -hmm. So we've seen some of those things, and in, in, again, in a much smaller scale of looking at when we, um, like in LV hypertrophy, when we, like for hypertension or aortic stenosis, mm -hmm. when we reverse those that you see the RV, uh, or sorry, the LV in that situation, hypertrophy regress mm -hmm. and things come back. So I think that there, it is dynamic. Of course, you also will see some fibrosis and some scarring. And so those aren't reversible necessarily. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's an exciting question of yeah. kind of seeing out, you know, and then if it reverts, does it revert all the way back? Do we, uh -huh. you know, do we, does it keep a pathway turned on because we we change back some of the feedback regulation mm -hmm. yeah I think lots of questions yeah and, and I mean if you understand those therapeutic pathways that are activated during that reversal process mm -hmm. you know are they causal right. are, are, is activation of those mm -hmm. uh, pathways during reversal do, could you could you stimulate those yeah. pathways in a patient yeah. and, and that, yeah. reverse heart failure well that's I mean honestly that was really my first goal of saying mm -hmm. like I've got this fetal program you know, mm -hmm. do we need to turn part of it back on? And this is, I think, is an interesting place. You know, it's funny how certain things kind of you hear and you just accept. Mm -hmm. And so I will say that, you know, in my training, in my clinical training, I always heard that when people, when humans develop heart failure, the heart turns on a fetal gene program. Like how many times have we heard that? Yeah. The fetal gene program mm -hmm. is reactivated. Well, when I went back and looking at that, the data behind that is actually incredibly small. And it's not truly a fetal gene program. It's a subset of genes that somebody picked that said that they like. Yes. Um, and, and they so, put a nice term to it. They put a nice term to it. But you just like, you assume like there's this fetal gene program that's reactivated and you know, it's all these things that happen. Now I can tell you now, at least from the pig, I can tell you what the fetal gene program is in the LV and in the RV. Um, and not surprisingly, it's not all turned on in the human, in, the, in, in heart failure, because the fetus isn't breathing. You know, I mean, it's it's a dual chamber, both ventricles are high pressure system. The physiology is very different, mm -hmm. but that's really kind of what stimulated some of these things of just, you know, you hear these things and it just becomes what is. Um, and so it's kind of fun to kind of go back and try to say, oh, but here's actually some data of some of these things. I'm gonna ask my co-host if he's got a question on his mind, uh, Keith. I don't have any questions right now. This is, this is really good work, and I can't wait to start working with you on some of these questions because I find it very fascinating to look at some of the programming. Uh, I noticed some of the hypertrophy genes, for instance, were turned on in the first week, and they were off early, mm -hmm. but then they turned off again yeah. uh, in the adult. And that's actually what we see in the left ventricle a lot of times. We see hypertrophy first before we go into any dilatation or failure. Mm -hmm. And I was seeing the same thing in some of your gene profiles that was occurring. So yeah. I find it very fascinating and, and I'd like to work with you on some of these studies. Yeah, exactly. We're, yeah, like I said, I mean, I think part of these fun things are finding some of this data and then figuring out what to do with it and interpreting it, you know, cause I mean, we really have like, you know, I don't know, like 5.4 terabytes of ACTs and Gs <laughs> that we're going through in addition with the proteomic data too. And so it is a lot. Um, but I think, you know, just that one example of where, you know, we're looking at a pathway that we've, um, that has been identified, you know, in the pH model of looking at stuff, I think there's some really exciting opportunities to look at some of these things. One of the pathways that you saw activated with, uh, the banding model was, mm -hmm. uh, a pathway for a metabolic switch, right? Mm -hmm. you, saw, you saw a gly glycolysis being activated. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And it's interesting because in looking at the, the, uh, respiratory, uh, the electron respiratory train that we saw in in in, uh, in rats, they had a very consistent, you know, kind of change. Mm -hmm. And when we saw that in pigs, all the the complexes are regulated differently. Mm -hmm. 
is where the rats seem to be all regulated in unison. Hmm. And so I think again that that shows, not surprisingly, that, that that regulation of even just the electron transport chain with respiratory cycle is much more complicated in a large animal model mm -hmm. than a small animal model. So we're starting to try to dig through some of those things of look at, you know, there's some mitochondrial work, you know, that Kurt and his group are, are looking at and doing. So again, I think it's just, you know, it's like peeling back the layers of an onion, mm -hmm. you know, that you start kind of understanding a little bit. And then, and sometimes I think the most important thing is realizing the things that you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, that you thought you knew, but I actually know the more I know, the more I realize what we don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and then that helps us kind of, again, kind of key in to ask some of those questions. I'd like to drill down into the glycolytic story a little bit. Um, do you know if it was the non-myocytes or the myocytes or both that are undergoing this glycolytic switch? Did you do single cell analysis? So we haven't. So in this data, we did not. So this is just total RNA-seq. I will say that, you know, Kurt's group has actually looked at a, a mitochondrial, uh, a, a cardiomyocyte enrichment, so where they really just are pulling out cardiomyocytes and then are taking mitochondria from mm -hmm. those, and it's in those they're looking at in um, the mitochondria from the cardio cardiomyocytes. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, uh, we have uh, just, just uh, again, with, on the glycolytic switch, I think that's fascinating. And uh, on the, on the non-myocytes, if it's occurring there as well, uh, it might be facilitating uh, cell fate changes. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so we've, we've got some data showing that uh, cell fate transitions are dependent upon a glycolytic switch. And what's going on there is that the uh, glycolytic switch is supp supplying more acetyl-CoA to the nucleus, which mm -hmm. is used in histone acetylation. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. as you know, histone acetylation opens up the chromatin. Yep. Now the cell is in this state of plasticity, mm -hmm. and that could be a good thing or a bad thing. Yeah. And you know, it can it can facilitate endothelial to mesenchyme transition, which could be associated with the cardiac fibrosis in mm -hmm. heart failure and pulmonary artery hypertension. Well, and I think there's a whole story and, you know, um, we could talk for hours about those things, but in actually when we were looking at some of, if you remember back in the RV where we talked, I showed you those um, two different clusters of where the RV uh, genes went from high to low. Mm -hmm. And one of those clusters, the top like five or six kind of pathways are all histone and deacetylation and other stuff. Oh, interesting. So I think that the, again, there's a lot of that regulation that's coming in. The other pathway actually really looked at a lot of transcriptional regulation and other stuff. So mm -hmm. I think that there's, again, there's, I think we're gonna find a lot of dual um, control of different things. Another thing that you talked about, we in you by mentioning up about the cell fate, it kind of triggered a memory. When we looked at um, in our pathway of looking at um, our right ventricular ejection fraction and the transcriptome and proteomes that correlated with that, one of the genes that actually corresponded and was predictive of RV ejection fraction was actually. Um, a uh, Neiman pick protein, and the reason it's un un unimportant, but it actually has been um, thought to play a role in autophagy oh. and different, uh, with different um, higher levels of lipid and lipid engorgement and then flipping over the um, autophagy process and some of those things. And so again, I think it's a whole nother pathway that hadn't really looked at in the you know, RV particularly of you know, autophagy. And, and we know there's a lot of work being going on in that in the LV and other things. So. Um, yeah, I mean, we kind of have a little bit of a treasure trove of data. Unfortunately, we're trying to figure out which shiny thing we want to look at first. <laughs> <laughs> which shiny bauble to go after Exactly, first. which shiny bauble. <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, Keith and I have been working on it, along with Arvind Bimaraj and uh, the group, uh, at uh, an interesting hypothesis uh, that uh, the recovery from heart failure mm -hmm. is a vascular recovery. And we've got uh, really some interesting data with LV. Mm -hmm. failure. It would be interesting to look with you at RV failure, wouldn't yes. it? Do you want to yeah. talk a little bit about uh, the evidence that uh, recovery from heart failure is a vascular recovery? T tell us about what were the in initial observations that led to that hypothesis and an R01 that yeah, we have yeah. now yeah. to investigate the hypothesis. Well, we, we've done a lot of work with the left ventricle primarily here. And in the left ventricle, we see when we put in, in, in uh, LVADs in patients that there's a decrease in the fibrosis. You know, something that, you know, for a long time was controversial because the fibrosis can actually decrease and there's actually an increase in function in the heart. So now you talk about, um, so, so it's pre-LVAD, there's Correct. a fair amount of 
fibrosis and loss of microvascular density. And then after that, LVAD's been in for about a year, I guess, is on average, right? Yes. When, when the LVAD comes out, the left ventricular cystifies comes out, then you look at the heart again, and you're seeing interesting differences between the pre and post LVAD. Right. There's a, there's a lot of things that change. The fibrosis is just a, a very obvious marker that we can visually see mm -hmm. change. But the cells get smaller. The What we've always called the fetal uh, uh, gene profile reverses. The, the few genes we look at, they reverse and, and go back as well. So it would be interesting to look at the right ventricle and find out what's going on. The other thing we see in the, in the left ventricle is when that reverses, there's an increase in endothelial cell number that corresponds to the decrease in fibroblast number that came in and went up in the original heart failure. So we started hypothesizing that there was a vascular recovery that occurred. And in fact, that's what we're seeing. When we're doing perfusion studies and measuring the volume of the vessels after recovery in a mouse model, we see that there is a recovery of the vascular volume mm -hmm. and an increase in that volume uh, that is, is commensurate with the decrease in the fibroblast and the fibrosis. So it may indicate that there's an MET switch going on, the reverse of what we see going into heart failure. Mm -hmm. yeah, and it's we're doing the lineage tracing actually mm -hmm. to, to, to prove that, yeah. uh, that, that there's a endothelial to mesenchyme transition early on and then later there's, uh, with recovery, there's a mesenchyme to endothelial cell uh, reversal of mm -hmm. that fibrosis and an expansion of the microvasculature. Be lovely to see if we could do that in right heart failure. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a lot of you know, and a, a, a lot of interesting areas of overlap. But I think again, a lot of places where they're going to be very different. Yeah. You know, and kind of figuring out where those things are, and and you know, your vascular, you know, phenotype that you see kind of fits with what we saw. I mean, back in the early stem cell regeneration. So that was back in the first part of my scientific career of looking at you know early stem cells and progenitor cells and we all you know thought that we're we're going to see a lot more dramatic changes but a lot of that recovery really was vascular while know. we've been talking a lot of questions have come <laughs> <Okay>. up <laughs> so we should give uh, the crowd a, a chance to ask you some questions cindy okay. um, do we have an idea of the proportion of the role of receptors like mechanoreceptors that are over under expressed in the large animal models we're just learning i mean again mm -hmm. we're starting to get some of these i mean obviously you know even the RV is a little bit different because it doesn't really have, I mean, it's not a high pressure system at, at baseline and we're making it a high pressure system. So yeah, there's, there's so many other physiologic aspects to look at um, mm -hmm. and we're just starting to understand those. Will mechanical assist devices for RV failure become mainstream as they are for LV dysfunction? What's the, f the future? So there are some cases where we can do assist devices in the right ventricle. Um, the, it's the challenges with RV um, failure is is it just a, a is it just a mechanical issue so as we talked about before a lot of the RV failure is coming from higher pressures it's being causative and we the mechanical uh, circulatory devices that we have really right now aren't really programmed to work against some of those and there's also a lot of other complications that kind of come in especially is you know with our um, pH models of bleeding pulmonary hypertension pulmonary hemorrhage and other stuff that kind of comes through with some of these things. Um, if the right ventricle is is damaged just from like an, a, a heart attack, a right ventricular infarct, and the RV can enlarge, yeah, in those cases we have been able to put in uh, uh, mechanical support devices in the right ventricle. Unfortunately, the anatomy of the right ventricle also makes it harder because it's a smaller ventricle, it's a lot of trabeculations, and it decompresses pretty quickly, and so you get a lot of suction when you try to move mm. a lot of stuff. So just the whole physiology of the RV makes it harder to treat with MCS, mm. um, but we have been doing it. Now the flip side is if, like in our patients that I talked about before that are like transposition patients where their RV is actually pumping to the body, so when their RV is their systemic ventricle, in those cases, we've been very successful in putting in NCSs. So, mm -hmm. because again, it's just, you know, you're in the same, the RV pumping to the aorta, the same physiology, it's just a different uh, ventricle. Another question on hemodynamics in your PA banding model. Mm -hmm. uh, are there any shunts, intracardiac or extracardiac that? Uh, no, 
So yeah. when we do the show, so when we, they are otherwise normal. Um, now, can I swear that some small PFO doesn't reopen just like it does in humans? Possibly. Mm -hmm. But we've uh, looked at these pretty extensively through MRI, doing QPQS measurements and those kind of things. And so we're not seeing uh, shunting. Now, would they develop, you know, stuff later? Maybe, well, we're only, uh, we're looking at about a, a month. Mm -hmm. you know, or two months of, of the data here. But it's a very unusual um, that we see shunting actually develop, it, even in, in, in pH, in, in primary pulmonary hypertension, mm -hmm. of where it's really just that vascular resistance model. There's another question about GP130, and you gave us just a tidbit about mm -hmm. GP130. Yeah. Uh, the, the question is, uh, have you observed any effects of GP130 on the LV? But, but before you get into that, tell us a little more about what is GP130 and how is it involved in RV failure? And then maybe you can answer the question about LV failure. Yeah, so it's a ligand that uh, interleukin-6, one of the many ligands that interleukin-6 uh, binds to, mm -hmm. has a a cascade, uh, one of the things that, that we talked about, uh, one of the uh, downstream is stat proteins, also um, uh, junctophilin too is one of the main ones. Um, but it's a big cascade that we look at stuff and it does again come down and it can directly have mitochondrial effects mm -hmm. through the mitochondrial, the T-tubules and the, and, the, and the tubules in the mitochondria as well as T-tubules in the, in the uh, cardiomyocytes. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're, um, starting to tease out we know i think what gp130 does in the rat and now we're looking to see if we can figure out more of what gp130 does in the pig model we have some kind of uh, correlative data in humans but i think we'll, we're going to try to understand that pathway a little bit more um, it sounds like globally when you activate when il6 binds to gp130 you get a a lot of pathways being yeah. activated that cause impair yeah. cardiomyocyte contractility. Yes. Is that yes. correct? Yes. And so then I guess the question is really an important one. It, does IL-6 activate GP-130 in the left heart because IL-6 is increased with a lot of things like coronavirus, yeah. right? Yeah. And does that play, yeah. does GP-130 play a role? In you know, and honestly, I don't know. I mean, you know, we've mm -hmm. looked a lot of it in the RV and I guess I've kind of been in my little, my little my little tunnel over there, the RV side, um, it wouldn't surprise me, you know, mm -hmm. that we see it. I think it's, I don't want to misspeak, and I, I, I could, I think it is more upregulated in the RV dysfunction than LV, but I'm sure that there may be roles in the LV as well. Okay. Another question that just came in, is there a rationale to check the pigs uh, for pulmonary embolism after the banding? That, could that introduce a bias? Um, so we do do an MRA. So we do, we do a, uh, an angiography of the pigs when we look at stuff. The, the banding, um, they still have you know, pretty good flow through those and there's no um, upregulation in the hypercoagulable state. And we don't, even in the hypercoagulable state that we see in normal you know, pulmonary arterial hyper, uh, pulmonary arterial hypertension, that's more of an endothelial dysfunction as the, as the vascular remodels. We're not recapitulating that. And it is important. We're not really recapitulating complete, you know, um, pulmonary arterial hypertension. We're creating a, a pressure overload. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the vascular remodeling that occurs in, in primary pulmonary uh, uh, hypertension, we're not really recapitulating that. We're just recapitulating the pressure. Mm -hmm. So there's going to be subtleties that are going to be different. You know, um, before we let you go, and we're getting close to the end here, one of the things you said that really intrigued me was that a lot of the drugs we use in heart failure don't work in RV mm -hmm. heart failure. So left and heart, left and right are mm -hmm. different in terms mm -hmm. of the, the response to drugs. Um, is that true of beta blockers and ACE inhibitors? Yeah. I mean, so, why, I mean, I, I don't understand that because, I mean, don't you have beta adrenergic receptors in the cardiac myocytes yeah. on the right side of the heart? Don't you have uh, mm -hmm. angiotensin II receptors mm -hmm. on the right side of the heart? So yeah. why don't these things work? So it's interesting. Um, the short answer is that, you know, we don't really know. But if you go back and even look at some of the things, I'm flipping back through the slides just to highlight this again. But some of the things that we look at it in the um, right side of the heart, when you look at like alpha-1 signaling, it decreases inertropy and pressure overload in the RV where it increases it in the LV. Um, again, looking at there's a lower beta myo heavy chain contact in the right compared to the left. Um, there's again looking at, you know, stimulation, like even estrogen receptor stimulation is beneficial in the right and is maybe detrimental or not beneficial in the left. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it also could be as simple as that, you know, there's not as much muscle. 
-hmm. and the right ventricle as there is the left ventricle. I mean, there's, we know that the myocyte density is smaller, the, 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 you know, even the muscle wall is smaller. Again, how they contract is different. Um, as far as like, is it a longitudinal or is it that twisting that we see? So, you know, there is some data that is maybe, you know, we can see some effects of, you know, uh, like beta blockers and ACEs and ARBs, but to date, none of, none of those mm. have shown to provide any uh, mortality benefit. The only drug that may have some is digoxin, mm. and that's even as equally kind of, you could, we could spend all day arguing about digoxin's benefit, even in LV failure, you know, and RV failure. And so, now, we need to be clear, there are definitely some drugs that treat pulmonary hypertension. Mm. And so a lot of the drugs that are treating, that are reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance, you know, like the, you know, the endothelium receptors, the, the Flolans, the epiprostanol, now some of the, even the uh, CGMP, the cyclic phosphorylase, you know, there's a lot of drugs, a huge, in the nitric oxide pathway, the PGF5 inhibitors, the uh, uh, sildenafils of the world. I mean, there's a huge group of medications that we have that have now, over the past probably 15 years, that have really changed the clinical tra trajectory of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Mm -hmm. But that's treating the pulmonary vascular resistance. Mm -hmm. But as far as treating the RV cardiomyocyte failure, to date we don't have any drugs. Fascinating. Clearly we need to do more research yes. on the right heart and we're <laughs> glad you're here. Yes. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cindy Martin, for joining us here at the cutting edge of cardiovascular sciences. Thank you all uh, for joining us here and uh, for this wonderful symposium. And we look forward to hearing more about your research here. Yes, I Houston am excited. Methodist. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Thanks, Keith. <laughs>